want you to see with me in Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. David says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. God, early will I seek you. Listen to the words that David uses. He said, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh is, is yearning and longing for you. Does that describe your relationship with God this morning? Does your soul long for him? Are you seeking him? I'm preaching on that word today, seek. The word seek is found 313 times in the Bible. To seek means to aggressively pursue. It's not laid back. It's not casual. It's not I'm here, touch me if you want to touch me, move me if you want to move me. But to seek is to aggressively pursue. We must seek God in times like these. That's what we're doing, to pursue him, to know him, to, to come back to him, to come back to where we started out to be with him, to rearrange our priorities and even say to God with abstaining from food and things that are normal in life, that I want you to be the priority of my life this year. We must seek God fervently. We must not be laid back about our Christianity. We must have seasons where we absolutely are seeking God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is not unusual New Testament Christianity. It's how they lived, and yet we've strayed so far. When we are weak with God, temptation is strong. When we are strong with God, temptation is weak. The stronger I am with God when I'm seeking him, the weaker temptation is. The weaker I am, the less I'm seeking God, and the stronger temptation becomes in my life and in your life. Sometimes we look at people who have an awesome relationship with the Lord, they just radiate with God's presence. It's not a game. It's not a show. It's not something they do. They actually walk with the Lord. And you can sense it and you can feel it. And they're overcoming. They have an overcoming spirit. They're overcoming. It's not that their life is perfect, but they walk in victory. And we even say to ourselves, oh, they must have been born that way. Or, you know, I'm just different. I don't have that kind. That's, that's just not... I don't have that kind of relationship with the Lord. Like they found something. Like they were born with it. Like it was in their DNA and, the, and nothing could be further from the truth. If you see someone with a good, powerful relationship with God, it's because they are earnestly seeking and pursuing God daily. They're doing it. You know, there's a great verse in, in Psalms 10 in verse four where God said, I, he said, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek, does not seek God. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God's definition of, weak, of wickedness is a person who does not seek God. You see, are you seeking him fervently? The difference between people who have the touch of God, the presence of God, the wisdom of God, the favor of God, that spirit, that, that very disposition, it's because they've been in his presence. They're seeking him fervently. They didn't stumble upon it. They weren't born with it. They, they're seeking him through scripture reading. They're seeking him through prayer. They're seeking him through worship. They're seeking him through giving and attending and serving. There are two reasons why people have powerful relationships with God. Number one, they always, the people who have powerful relationships with God, they always have people pouring into their life. They have pastor, they have other voices, they have 
maybe someone that they're listening to on podcasts that's feeding their spirit or YouTube or whatever, but they're constantly being poured into. And the second reason that people have powerful relationships with God is through pain and through problems. There's something about pain and problems that drives you to your knees and drives you to such desperation that you begin to seek God. Psalms 9 and verse 10 said, and those who know your name will put their trust in you, O Lord, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. You may feel forsaken, but if you will seek God, he will find you. As I said a moment ago, God's definition of wickedness is a person who doesn't seek God. That's astounding to me. God says, that's how I define wickedness, as people who ignore me, as people who have no time for me, as people who never do anything to aggressively pursue me. He said again in Psalms 10 in verse 4, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. The wicked in his proud countenance says, listen, I don't need to fast. I don't need to pray. I don't have to read the Bible. I thumb through it every once in a while. I I, I can hit skip and miss. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That, God says, is a wicked person because they're not depending on me. Their, Their wickedness does not take time to read the book. Wickedness does not get alone and have a God conscious that says, God, I need you. The first thing, and he goes on to say in that same verse, God is not in none of their thoughts. In other words, the last thing that comes up in their mind when problems of life come is God. He's like way on down the list. Here's how you know that you're really out of touch with God and you really need something powerful and fresh to happen to you spiritually. When you're not seeking God, the first thing that you ought to do is pray and seek God. But when you're not seeking God, God is not in your thoughts. It's like, well, I'll handle that problem and I'll do this and let's talk about doing this and let's go to that one, let's do that one. But the first thing you ought to do when you're seeking God and you will do is think about God. You will turn to God. The first thing that you ought to do when you come up against problems and challenges with your children, with your family, with your marriage, with your finances, when you feel anxiety and fear, when you're seeking God, something in you will say, pray, cry out to God, speak the name of Jesus. That's what we do. But when you're far from God, because you're not in vital relationship with him, your mind is not even He's not even in there. You almost have to remember God after you've gone through your list of how to fix it. Psalms 14 and 2, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, listen to that, who seek God. God is looking down from heaven and he's saying from heaven, is there any who are seeking me? Are there any who will seek me in 2022? Are there any preachers who are seeking me? Are there any parents who are seeking me? Are there any young people who are seeking me for my plan for their life, act aggressively pursuing me and seeking me? Are there any teenagers? Are there any college students? Are there any people who are seeking me? Are there any business people seeking me or politicians seeking me? Are there any doctors or attorneys that are seeking me? You have to understand that God has, God has said, I look for people who seek me. God will speak to you. God will come to you. In Psalms 27 in verse eight, he said, David said, when you said, oh God, seek my face, my heart said, Your face will I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me or forsake me. And then he goes on to say, if my mother and father forsake me, if I'll seek him, the Lord will take care of me. 
There's so many broken families and broken homes, but to the individual who seeks the Lord, he'll be a father to you. He'll be a mother to you. He'll be a provider to you. He'll be a door opener to you. He'll bless your life. In Psalms 14 and verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven to those that seek him. When you seek his face, God will absolutely whisper in your ear times in your walk with Jesus. Will you seek my face? Will you? I miss you. You're not who you started out to be. You're not seeking me anymore. I miss you. It's been a long time since I, I, I was with you. I know we're saved. I know we, we have our ticket to heaven. But there's more to this than that. He wants us to seek him and he will be with us. And when he says, seek my face, your response needs to be, your face will I seek. I'm going to seek your face these 21 days. Psalms 34 and verse 10 is a powerful promise of provision. I look at all of you today, and, 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 and many of you have tremendous responsibilities. Many of you run businesses or have the whole weight of the world, so to speak, on, on your shoulders financially, single mothers that are listening to me, people who are facing great uh, financial situations in your life, and God has been good, and God has been faithful, but the truth is, you need God's hand on you for a new year, and you know it. Listen to this great promise for the seeker. He said in Psalms 34 in verse 10, the young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack in any good thing. If you will be a person who seeks God, oh, hear me today. If you will be a person who obeys Matthew chapter 6 and seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all of these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And notice what he said in Psalms 34 and 10. He said, if you will seek the Lord, you will lack no good thing if you'll be the aggressor and the pursuer in the relationship. Those that seek the Lord, they will lack no good thing. He'll withhold no good thing. Nothing will be held back that is good for you, God said. A spouse is a good thing. A husband is a good thing. A wife is a good thing. A family is a good thing. Children are a good thing. Health is a good thing. Jobs and a house and a car, that's a good thing. And he said, I have them. I'll withhold no good thing from people who seek me. An education is a good thing. Friends are a good thing. Success and peace and direction and favor and increase and open doors. Just seek the Lord. He's got everything and he'll hold no good thing from anyone who seeks him. Give him a mighty praise if you believe it. Hallelujah. It's all in seeking him. Not coming to church. Seeking him. Seeking him. You'll lack nothing. Go after God. Set these days aside and go after God. Aggressively pursue him. Fervently. Are you tired of being stuck? Are you tired of being addicted? Are you tired of being immoral? Let all of those who seek you rejoice and be glad, one Bible verse said. Rediscover a portion of gladness and joy. He says, when you carve out time for me, when you seek me, I look for you. I look for people who do that and I target them. I bless them. It's that simple. You see, I'm asking you simply, how's your seeking going? I sat in my office this week and I took a notepad and I set it out like I normally do and I get four ink pens of different colors. 
And I had my Bible and I had piles of notes, things that I've set aside for this, that, and the other, and this thought and that thought. And I said, Everybody's got how they do it, little books here and there and this and that. And I just stared at that black, that blank piece of notebook paper in front of me, notepad. I've been doing this a long time. I've been preaching a long time, decades. And I thought about the year ahead and I thought about the kind of year we had last year. And I asked myself, can I do this again? Can I do this another year? Can I take this? Can I, can I feel these pieces of paper up with somehow hearing a word from God for these precious people? And the weight of it sometimes is crushing. If you take it serious, it's this is not a profession. This is not a career. This is eternal stuff right here. And I don't know. I, I felt such anxiety. I just kind of put my hands in my face and, and just ran my hair, my fingers through my hair. And I said, God, can I do this? And I tell you, I heard the voice of the Lord come and say, if you'll seek me, you can. If you'll seek me, you can. And I know one thing. I can't answer what all's coming this year, but I know one thing. I'm going to be seeking the Lord because whatever comes, he will prepare us and he will take us to gladness and victory and joy, not anxiety, not, in, not fear, not worry, not depression, not despair, but God wants his people filled with joy and happiness and faith that overcomes the world. Give him a hand clap of praise if you believe that if we seek him, he will come. He said, ask and you shall receive, Matthew 6. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. And so I go to Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. It's a powerful seeking verse. We, we know the first part of the verse, but it's all anchored and connected to one thing. You don't just get it automatically. It's a famous verse. For I know the plans and the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil. Isn't that good to know? That God's not thinking disaster. That God's not a mean, mad, monster God sitting up in heaven planning destruction and calamity and death and hurt and tears and sorrow the rest of your life. No, he may, he may let you go through seasons of that, but our God is faithful and he said, if you'll hold on in due season, I'll turn the battle and you will come forth victorious. And he said, I know the thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Then, everybody say then, you will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen to you. And then the next verse says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That hope that future, that purpose, that big plan, God's big plan for your life, he said, I have it. I have hope. I have a plan. I have it all figured out. But you'll only find it when you seek me and search for me with all of your heart. And that's why this is so powerful, because you can't fast and play around about it. But when you search for me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Isn't that beautiful? If you'll seek me, if you'll seek me, the key to finding the will of God, the direction of God for the rest of your life, the plan of God, the plan that God has that is for your future and is full of hope, is in, it's all predicated upon you seeking him. I've got it. I'll do it. When you seek God, there's something powerful 
that is released in your life. And I'll close with this verse. But there is a, uh, there is a powerful verse in 2 Chronicles 26 in verse 5. And I'll never forget a man by the name of Norval Hayes came through many, many years ago when we were in the little church on Browns Bridge Road. And he taught this message, and it changed my life. i would never heard this verse like he taught it. His name was Norval Hayes. He's gone on to be with the Lord. And he taught this message, and God burned it into my heart. And, and it's one of those life scriptures for me. It said, and so, speaking of Uzziah, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, and he had understand. He sought God, and God gave him understanding of the vision of God. Now watch this. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper to prosper. Everybody say that with me. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And let me tell you what that looked like. In verse 11, it said God helped him defeat his enemies. He had some powerful enemies. But you see, when you seek the Lord, he, he makes you to prosper. And prospering means you start defeating your enemies. In verse 8, he became exceedingly strong. In verse 9, it said that he built, he began to build stuff. One translation said the dream began to materialize. He had a vision, but now it becomes real. It's, it's literal. It begins to happen. Why? Because he sought the Lord. God made him to prosper. Verse 15, he started inventing stuff. The Bible said God brought to him skillful men who invented all kinds of new weapons and all kinds. And listen what else happened. When he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper and his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped. And I'll never forget Norval teaching that lesson that as long as you seek the Lord, God will marvelously help you and favor you and bless you. And then those last few words of that verse, until he was marvelously helped and blessed until he became strong. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. But when, but when God said to him, I've made you to prosper, and the Bible said the moment he got so strong that he thought, I don't need to fast and pray. I don't need the scriptures. I don't need the word. I don't need to seek God. I don't need to aggressively pursue God. Then something happened when he became strong. And if you're listening to me today and you would say, I know I'm cold. I know in my walk with God, I'm distant. I know I'm just bumping along. I'm a busy person. The most dangerous period of our life is when, is when God blesses us and we stop seeking him. Hear me, Free Chapel. We must never stop seeking God. And you might have dread this time in the year and it kind of gets on your nerves, but you don't understand. We were doing this 30 years ago and it's the reason that everything that we have and everything that we've done, God has had his tender touch on it and we can't stop now. As long as we seek the Lord, he'll make us to prosper. There's a voice that's saying, seek my face. In a brand new year, seek my face. Isaiah 51 in verse 1, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you came. In other words, go back to where you came from. Go back to where it all started. Go back and seek that freshness, that sensitivity, that desire, that tender spirit, that brokenness. Go back. Go back to where it all began and come back to me, God is saying. Seek me again. Pursue me. Come after me. One of the things that God laid on my heart to do, I've read this little book. It's just a, about 130 pages this week. And, uh, and it's called How to Eat Your Bible. 
and it really blessed me. And uh, the bottom line is he gives some quick references, and he says, your words were found. This is Jeremiah 15 and 16, and I ate them, Jer uh, Jeremiah said, and your words became a joy and a delight to me. I thought about how that they walked. The Bible said in Luke 24 that the disciples on the road to Emmaus heard Jesus speaking the words, and they said, did not our heart burn within us at the word of God? Listen, one says, I ate your word. And it was... to me. Another, two other disciples in the New Testament said when he spoke the word, it was, it was, we got holy heart burned. Did not our hearts burn within us? Hebrews, when, do you ever feel that way about the word? What about Hebrews 12, 4 and 12? The word of God is alive and active and stronger than a two-edged sword. If you open your Bible exactly halfway, it'll fall on Psalms 119. Psalms 119 was written by David, and it, the whole chapter is about the splendor of God's word. And he'll say, your word is a treasure. I delight in your word. He makes phrases like, I rejoice in your word. Your law is wonderful. I delight in your law. It has 176 verses. It's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And it's all about the, mat, the beautiful, beautiful word of God. One of the great verses in it says that your word is like honey from a honeycomb. And it sounds like David has kind of lost his mind when you read it, but he just one verse after another, the word, the word, the word, the word. And then you compare that to Amos chapter 8. And Amos said, the days are coming when there will be a famine in the land, not a famine for bread or water, but the lack of hearing the word of the Lord. I'm going to tell you, if there is a famine that is ever fit a generation, it's this, this famine, a famine of reading and appreciating this book. We have more access to the scriptures than any generation in human history. In 2014, a thorough study was done. 88% of Americans own a Bible. 88%. The average family has 4.7 Bibles in their home. The appetite for the Word of God has been diminished, not increased. That same poll said 48% of American adults completely Christians are disengaged from reading the Bible. When they were po polled privately and asked, do you read your Bible daily? 48% said, I don't just not read it daily. I am totally disengaged from ever reading the Bible. 9% more on top of that said they only interact with the scripture sporadically. That's 57% of the people in a congregation like this, and I'm not here putting you down. I'm not here, I, I'm, I'm here saying something's got to give this year. You just don't keep bumping along, bumping along. And the most important thing that you can ever have is this book, and it sits there collecting dust on the shelf. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Hallelujah. The Bible has a little impact on six out of 10 people is what that stat said. They don't read it. They don't consume it. 
The only time they hear it is if they go hear a preacher preach, maybe. And now, now the latest statistic, most people since COVID only go to church about once every month. It used to be, you know, a man two or three times and out once a month. Now it's gone down to once a month. The, the people are no longer taking their families to church regularly. The word of God, it's like right in the middle, a Bible's everywhere. There's a famine in the land for the word of God. We used to be known as the people of the book. We used to memorize scriptures, meditate. Just one generation ago, they taught us to talk the word. They taught us to speak the word. They taught us to talk to our mountains, the word of God. We're starving ourselves to death. We're depressed. We're, we're, we're anxious. We're worried. We're, de we're defeated. We're, 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 we're filled with anxiety. There's contention and strife. We're starving ourselves to death. I guess what I'm preaching is eat up. I'm almost done. So here's my challenge to you. When Jesus fasted for 40 days, his chief weapon, you remember, he, he, he had to deal with his own hunger for 40 days, no food, 40 days. That's enough. He was out in the elements. Camping out is a challenge just all of its own when you're all prepared for it. 40 days in the wilderness, no food. The elements, he's freezing at night. He's hot in the summer during the day. If that's not enough, your Bible said Satan came to him three different times, targeted him specifically while he was fasting, and said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus' chief weapon he starts quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8, I believe it is. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Satan came back again. He pulls it out. It is written, thou shalt worship the Lord our God and him only. It is written, it is written, it is written. And he did it three times. And the Bible said Satan left him and angels came and ministered unto him. This is time to take this book and consume it. And here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. There are 27 chapters in the New Testament. And I'm going to read the entire New Testament. That means I'm going to read at least a book of the Bible every day. And I'll make up the other uh, 21, 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, 27. I'll make up the other six because it's like 1 John. It's like five chapters. You can read it quick, quick, quick. You can just throw them in there. Why not? Why not? What would happen to our soul if we, if we just said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat the Bible? Boy, God will see you when you open up that book and start reading that book. God will say, uh-oh, they're seeking me. I've got a plan for them. I wondered if they'd ever come after it. I've got the provision. They'll, not, they'll lack no good thing. I, I wondered if they'd ever come after it. You will never spend time in this book, young man, young lady, young couple. I know I, you, 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 you young couples, and you know, I so relate to you. You know, it's nothing wrong with a dream to have your own home and have all that stuff. I'm telling you where it's at. It's in your relationship with him. If you get him, he will bless you even greater than you could have ever imagined. Because what will happen is as long as you seek the Lord, he'll make you to prosper. Even in the hard times and the rough times, He'll cause you to overcome and prosper. God's going to touch our families. Say, God, I'm going to give you one more year. Isn't that what the fruit tree, you remember the fruit, the fruit tree? God said, give it one more year. Somebody said, well, I just don't know if I can keep doing this. Give it one more year. Woo, you don't put God to the test and watch and see if he won't come through. Throw your hand up and say, God, I'm going to give you one more year. <laughs> I know you're going to give him more than that. But go on and say, Lord, I'm going to give you one more year. I'm coming after you. I'm going to aggressively pursue you. 
why don't you stand up on your feet and why don't you raise up your hands at every campus in Orange County, wherever you are, and say, God. you I, I, I you may feel like I failed in the study the other day when you think about what you're facing this year and, and you just feel like saying I, I, I don't know if I can do this another year yes you can because God is going to find you when you seek him and it's gonna be a year of victory it's gonna be a year of healing it's going to be a year of miracles. It's going to be a year of family blessing. It's going to be a year of lives restored. It's going to be a year of souls saved. Addicts delivered. Prophecy given. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed at every campus. The pastors are coming, but there's a sweet anointing. Do you feel the presence of God in this room right now? It's just such a sweet presence of the Lord. And I sense deeply in my heart right now across our campuses and right here in this room that there are people who came here today who feel... You feel so distant from God. You feel so messed up. You feel like you failed. And you've, you've even said, what's the use? What's the use of even trying another year? I can't, I can't get free. I can't stop. I can't change. But it begins with a decision in a moment like this that's God whispering in your ear, seek my face. And if you're here and you would say at any of our campuses, Pastor, I'm distant and far from God, but I want to get back to him. I want to run back into his arms. I want to, I want to feel his love again. I want, to, I want something to happen to me in these early days of the new year. I, I, I really don't know how I'm going to make it if God doesn't help me and help me now. Pray for me. If that's you, boldly raise your hand. I want to see your hand all across the campuses. Raise them high. Every one of you in this room who would say, Pastor, I need to get back to God. Get out of that seat and come forward and do the same at every campus. Come on. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Come forward. Hold on just one moment. Just one moment. Come forward. Hurry. 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 Seek. See, that's what you're doing. Every step, you're seeking Him aggressively, diligently following after him, searching for him. You're seeking for him. That's it. Come on. Come on. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Someone else needs to get back to God. This is an important service for your destiny and for the purpose for which you were born. Come home to him today. Come home to him today. Come home to him today. He loves you. He loves you. I thank God let me feel what you've been feeling when I put my hands in my face. And I said, I don't know if I can do this. It was a feeling of helplessness. It was a feeling of, I don't know if I've got it in me. I'm weary. But God sees your weakness and God sees your, your situation and God knows what you've been through and he says, I've got grace for you. 
I understand. I know I will not give up on you. I will not leave you and abandon you like others have. I won't do that to you. I'm your God. Woo. I am your God. I know your name is written in the palm of my hand, the book of Isaiah said. Your name is in his very hand. Your royal diadem in the hand of your God. You're not a worthless nobody, piece of trash. You're a royal diadem, the book of Isaiah said. And God said, what I have in my hand, nothing can pluck it out. Hallelujah. Somebody's prayers are already getting answered. They may be in Michigan. They may be in Ohio. They may be in California. But somebody prayed and here's the answers taking place. Everybody say, Jesus, I run back to you. I will seek your face. I will give myself to you. I want to seek you. I want to know you. And in the name of Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, and restore my life. I praise you for it. You'll do it because you love me. Oh, yes, you do. Now raise those hands and praise him one more time. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.